Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to PrepMedic. This week I have Timogen. Timogen is a doctor, a, a finalist on alone and a veteran, a ton of outdoor uh, bushcraft experience. And today we're gonna be talking about uh, lower extremity orthopedic injuries in the backwoods. So basically if you break your ankle, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna mobilize it? And how are you going to get your friend or yourself out of the backwoods to definitive care. Obviously in you know a cityscape, you break your ankle, you break your leg, uh, you're pretty close to a hospital. You can get an ambulance, you can get in your car, you'll have somebody else drive you. It's not that big of a deal most of the time. But uh, here in the back country, if you break your leg, any injury that immobilizes you can be fatal. Uh, you know, you're, you're out in the elements, you need to eat and drink and get to definitive care at some point. So can you just go through what we're looking for first when you're approaching a patient like what you're assessing for and then how are we going to immobilize that leg so we can give them back a modicum of mobility to actually get out of the backwoods what, what's your first step when you come upon an injured person absolutely so in this type of climate it's rocky we don't know what's going on so obviously looking to see what the mechanism was. Our patient uh, was vocal. He says he fell down a little bit of a ravine. So are, is there any rocks that are gonna fall on top of us? Is the scene safe? And then just talking to them, you're kind of evaluating their ABCs, their airways open, their breathing's fine. They didn't have a spontaneous pneumo when they fell down or anything like that. Um, and uh, when you're evaluating the leg, one of the things that I, I like doing on every kind of extremity is checking the pulses, checking motor, checking sensory. So you'll see me do that in multiple different ways. Um, and just knowing what are the telltale signs of fractures. So I'm percussing on the long bones, um, kind of uh, proximally, no, no pain there. But when you're feeling the malleoli, both on the medial side and the lateral side, that's a little tender. Four foot's a little tender too, so that's a little suspicious for a fracture. And then just uh, making sure that every time you're doing it, you, like I was lucky to have you on the trail to stabilize it because doing it alone is number one, really painful, and they tend to jerk, and that could put things in, um, in bad places. So with this, like, obviously you can't always diagnose a fracture on the trail. So do we kind of, we kind of err on the side of caution for this, right? If we have somebody that has a bad ankle fracture, if it's angulated, obviously you can kind of surmise that there's a, a break or a dislocation, but if you have something that looks like it's in line, and it's severe pain, not able to walk in it, we're still gonna splint it the same. So even if you can't really tell the difference between a fracture mm -hmm. and a really bad sprain or something like that, it's still better to just go immobilize and, and work your way out. Right? Yeah, because the, the, the worry is, let's say if it's a bad sprain and you don't take off the boots, you don't check the pulses and it's actually a fracture or even a bad sprain that swells up and it's in a boot, then you might have trouble taking that boot off maybe a mile down or, or something like that. And that becomes uh, an issue. Maybe you get a little bit of a compartment issue there. And uh, since there's a lot of pain, they don't know the difference between that elevated pressure in the foot or, or is it just their sprained ankle? So that gets a, a little dicey too. So you wanna take off that boot, check the pulses, check the movement, check the sensation, and to see what you're working with. And uh, definitely if there's any bones sticking out, you're gonna need a hospital visit and some antibiotics in addition to a surgical consult. All right, so we've taken off the boot, we've assessed the leg, we're suspecting a fracture or a really bad sprain, something we want to immobilize. Why is immobilization important? What are we trying to accomplish there? So you don't want it to get worse. When you first, um, when you first see it, you're evaluating the pulses. If there's any breaks there that sever arteries, you don't want things to move. So you want to, to stay in that stable state. So again, uh, trying to immobilize if it's uh, a joint, bone above, bone below. If it's a long bone, joint above, joint um, below. So with that, um, we've determined we need to immobilize. We know why we're doing it. Uh, in this case, it's an ankle. So we're gonna mobilize essentially the, the bones of the foot mm -hmm. and um, the tibia and fibula uh, going up the leg. So with that, how are we actually going to accomplish this? In this case, we have a SAM splint that we're using, yeah. which is a, a great tool and pretty light, so you can carry it with you. It folds down flat. With this splint, though, you can't just throw it on the leg. What do you have to do with it? So there are a few ways to adjust the SAM. You can um, make it into a C, just like that. My preference is to make it as stable as possible, because why not? You're already there. So what I do is I bend it into a T formation with the flat edge uh, facing whatever the fleshy side is. So um, that really makes a very rigid uh, platform. And the, um, 
way we're stabilizing the, the ankle is we don't want a whole lot of plantar flexion. Um, so that saddle is wide enough, uh, especially when it's just a little bit out from um, the, the heel that it doesn't allow your, your foot to press down as much. Now, the one thing um, that I wish we did have is more padding, right? Because sure. that'd make it more comfortable, less pressure wounds uh, and so forth, but you gotta work with what you have. What would you use for padding if you had it on you? What's what stuff while you're you're hiking that you might have? So if you have like extra like base layers or or, or any kind of material that would work. Um, little microfiber towels are, are really nice. But again, we're in an environment where exposure might be even more dangerous than like some pressure wounds, right? right? So he could get hypothermia if we cut up his sweater and use that. So you're always playing that balance here when you have those limited resources. But uh, Sam Splint is a very light option and I use it for a bunch of different things. Like you can use it as a sit pad, you can use it to, to waft your fire, um, your flame into fire. So it's really, really um, useful and it's super light. Cool. So when we're doing that, in this case, the ankle, we're gonna bring it under, like you said, it's, it's reducing that plantar flexion, flexion. So it's reducing the, the foot coming forward um, uh, in layman's terms. When we get that done, we have to secure it some way. What's like, in this case, I feel like it's, it's you know, good, better, best mm -hmm. for what we're securing it with. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to secure it with? And then what, what can you use? Yeah. So what I would ideally secure it with is uh, just above the ankle. I really like that to be one of the most secure points because if it's not secure, what happens is you just push on a pedal like a car and that whole splint just like comes off. Right. So if you go just a little higher up to that bones on the other side of your ankles and have that secured really nicely, um, that could be done with um, cravats, like triangle bandages, material, t-shirt material, whatever. Um, but the top portion, if you don't have a whole lot of material, one elastic bandage going all the way up is, is pretty useful. Right. Uh, you saw that we only had two triangle bandages, so we only had two points of contact. The more contact you have there, the less likely it's going to slip out. And that's the, the big thing when we're going out and trying to hike out another mile or two is as he's hopping or moving around, we'll always have to like reevaluate every few minutes to make sure that's stable. So eventually it might be worthwhile to actually maybe take a piece of my t-shirt, which is under this shirt, um, just to, to tie that off. Cool. And one other trick you did that I really liked is actually like pulling that pant leg over the splint to kind of secure yeah. it in just that one extra little layer mm -hmm. um, for it. So if you can like roll the pant up, that's mm -hmm. great. In this case, we had to cut it because they were, you know, a little bit uh, tighter jeans, but if you can keep it over, put it down over the splint, it feels like that would hold it a little bit more yep. secure. That gives it a little more tension. Cool. And this is kind of step one. So hopefully we are in a place where we can just uh, get the person up, get under their shoulders, hike them out, you know, 300 yards to a vehicle driving yeah. to where they need to be. But, um, you know, as fate happens, you're five miles back, we need to make them a little bit more mobile with that. So what are, what are a couple options for mobility mm -hmm. to actually get that person out, assuming that we don't have rescue resources right there? For sure. So depending on size, again, we can lift them up and carry them every uh, little bit, especially if it's a child or something like that. But ideally, um, we don't want to exhaust three people, right? That would be the worst case scenario because we're losing calories. We might not have any extra food. We might not have any extra water. Uh, plus one of our guys is already injured, right? right? So um, in this situation, if he can walk himself, great. Um, we're lucky he only injured one ankle. So I wanted to get a walking stick for him, something that's at least uh, this high so that they can kind of hold with two hands. Because if it's a one-handed thing, there's a lot of like possibilities that it might snap, it might go a, a certain way, especially if you're doing pressure like this, it almost is easier to top over. And um, you want that uh, walking stick on the good side. Okay. Because if anything happens, if there's a slip in the rock or if he just loses his balance and he falls on the bad side and puts weight on that, again, that would defeat the purpose of immobilizing because right. you have a big shearing force with that uh, extra weight. Now, depending on how bad the patient feels, he can toe touch, he can balance a little bit on that. But um, if it's super painful and it's swelling more and more and more, you really want him to be off of it as much as possible. You know, all of this is relatively hypothetical. You know, in a lot of areas, you do have rescue teams that can come and get you. But uh, I think it's important for people to understand that those rescue teams are almost exclusively volunteer uh, in the United States, which means they, they're coming from home. 
they have to go pick up equipment, they have to get to the mountains, um, you know, have a command post set up, deploy to you. So a lot of times those teams are gonna be, you know, four or five hours minimum to just get to you. And then there's the whole process of getting you out. It takes a lot of manpower to physically carry a full grown adult out of the woods. So, you know, in this case, you know, yes, you can and should call for help, emergency services when possible. But um, I think it's important to be able to have a knowledge of self rescue so you can get out, diminish that time you're out in the wilderness. Uh, even if that's meeting them part way uh, and being able to assist their efforts uh, by those means. So, and, and five hours is plenty to you know succumb to uh, hypothermia and the elements if it's really bad conditions are rolling in or nights uh, coming around. Some teams don't operate a ton at night. Um, so being able to get out is, is super important, I, I think is the moral of that story. Absolutely, and as we'll learn in this series, um, be sure you have some survival yeah. stuff like, do you have any way to signal? Do you have any way to protect yourself against the elements uh, to make yourself at least more stable for the rescue to come to you? Because if you're just hiking out to a trail, which would be awesome, like, but again, hypothermia is going to be a big kicker. Hyperthermia might be a, an issue too. Absolutely. Stay tuned for more from this series. We're going to be posting videos on Survival Doctors page as well as Prep Medic covering a lot of different survival situations, uh, gear recommendations, emergency equipment, and ways that you can treat somebody in the back country. So if you have any questions about this video or want to see something else in the future, leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week.